Uh, so welcome to the GLBT Historical Society Museum. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, so my name is Lee Pfeffer. Uh, I use they them pronouns and I am the <coughs> museum operations manager here at the museum. But I wanted to have an opportunity to talk about what Gilbert Baker and the Rainbow Flag did for the queer community in galvanizing um, around a symbol and talk a little bit about where we were before and where we were after and where we are going now. Um, so we're gonna basically go through um, some history and kind of go through the history of a whole bunch of different queer symbols um, that have existed as far back as 600 BC. And then um, my lovely uh, assistant, Lena, who, <laughs> later my, my magician's assistant, um, yeah, Lino is a former intern here, and they have put together some great information on um, the, the uh, art of vexillography, which is flag making, and talking about uh, good design. And then we're going to give y'all some art supplies and have at it and do a fun kind of flag making or symbol making workshop. How does everybody feel about that? Cool. All right, so I'm going to talk at you. Um, <laughs> So we're going to start uh, kind of before, uh, so 1978 is when they raised the uh, racial flag for the first time. So we're going to talk a little bit about what, what did the queer community have to, um, to identify ourselves, to make connections between each other, to rally around before this symbol came around. Um, so who's familiar with Oscar Wilde? All right. Does anybody, does anybody know about Green carnations as a queer symbol. <laughs> uh, so uh, Oscar Wilde was like a, it was a dandy estate playwright in um, the 1800s and arguably one of the most well-known 19th century figures in Western history who was queer. Um, he's he's not necessarily the originator of this symbol as a queer signifier, but he certainly popularized. Uh, so Wilde spent time in the Parisian art and literary world in the 1880s, and in 1889 actually noted in an essay that the color green was, quote, in individuals always a sign of a subtle artistic temperament. Mm -hmm. Artists, yeah. Um, early sexologists also noted that uh, green was the favorite color of, quote, inverts, which was the term that was commonly used at the time to describe gay men. Um, Oscar Wilde himself was known for adorning himself with lilies and sunflowers, one of the very common things of, of the dandy aesthetic. Um, and at the, 19, at the 1892 premiere of his play, Lady Winter's Fan, Wilde actually adorned himself with a white carnation dip dyed in a distinctive, in a distinctive malachite color. So carnations are not naturally found in green hues. Um, so it created this like lurid blue-green artificial flower that blossomed not only in his buttonhole, but it was also in the lapel of the play's leading man and a dozen of Wilde's associates that he had invited to join in in the spectacle. Um, what does it mean, an associate of him asked, and Oscar Wilde being Oscar Wilde said, nothing, whatever, but that is just what nobody will guess. So he basically wanted the public to gaze upon the spectacle of all of these men walking into this play wearing <coughs> incarnations and wonder at its mystery coyly avoiding any answer. In the same conversation, he actually hinted to one of his followers that he should get a green carnation at a famous flower shop in London because they grew there. <laughs> <laughs> As anyone who knew, this is a quote from uh, the Oscar Wilde Tours travel organization, which uses the green carnation as their logo. Uh, As anyone who knew the decadent movement would see, Wilde was playing with one of his favorite ideas, that nature should imitate art and not the reverse. In that sense, the green carnation was symbolic. A flower of an unnatural color embodied the decadent and the unnatural. So, two years after the Lady Windermere's fan spectacle, uh, in 1894, a scandalous satirical novel titled The Green Carnation was published, at first anonymously. Um, Robert Hitchens is one of the people who actually um, published it, or he is the man who actually published it, and he was one of the men in Wilde's circle of admirers. The lead characters in the novel are closely based on Wilde and his lover, Lord Alfred, quote-unquote, Bosey Douglas, and it was an instant success. 
The novel's scandalous nature was instrumental in contributing to Wilde's arrest and trial for gross indecency, so much so that he actually had to publicly refute the widely held belief that he was the anonymous author. He wrote in the Pall Mall Gazette in October 1894, Sir, kindly allow me to contradict in the most emphatic manner the suggestion made in your issue of Thursday last, and since then copied into many other newspapers, that I am the author of The Reincarnation. I invented that magnificent flower, but with the middle class and mediocre book that asserts its strangely beautiful name, I have, I need hardly to say, nothing whatsoever to do. The flower is a work of art. The book is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was also a tongue-in-cheek reference to the reincarnation's past symbolism, which emerged decades later in the, in the lyrics of a song from Noel Coward's 1929 operetta, Bittersweet. That's the, uh, so here's the little cover for it. Uh, the song, titled We All Wore the Green Carnation, features four esteemed characters singing the lyrics in a parody of the dandy lifestyle. So they sing, Pretty boys, pretty boys, you may sneer at our disintegration. Haughty boys, naughty boys, dear, dear, dear. Swooning with affection, and as we are the reason for the 90s being gay, we all wear a green carnation. <laughs> so, Wilde was created as an empty mystery, the reincarnation would become indelibly associated with Wilde, furthermore known as a symbol of Victorian homosexuality. So that's our first little dip dive into history. <coughs> Let's move on to violence. Who here is familiar with Sappho? Yeah. Uh, so, violets are a symbol representing love between women that got, dates all the way back to 600 BCE. Um, originating with the ancient Greek lyric poet, the lyric poet Sappho. Several fragments of her poems, um, she's actually said to have written over 10,000 lines of poetry, but only 600 remain on scattered fragments of papyrus. You can see just how frustrating it would be to be an ancient, a scholar on ancient Greece trying to read these poems. There's so much missing. This is an example of a fragment. Um, Several of the fragments of her poems actually have lines describing a lover wearing garlands or crowns of violets. So this is just a little um, excerpt from one of her fragments called I have, not, I, have not, I have Had Not One Word From Her. And this little section is, if you forget me, think of our gifts to Aphrodite and all the loveliness that we shared, and all the, all the violet type tiaras, braided rosebuds, still and crocus, twined around your young neck. Mare poured on your head and on soft mats, girls, with all that they most wish for beside them. While no voices chanted, choruses without ours, no woodlot roomed in spring without song. And then another one. For many crowns of violets and roses at my side you put on, and many woven garlands made of flowers around your soft throat. And with sweet oil costly you anointed yourself, and on a soft bed delicate you would let loose your longing. Um, so these show up in multiple of her uh, poems. This is just kind of two examples. This is a, um, this is a statue, little bust of Sappho. This is the actual violet. Um, Sappho may have mentioned violets repeatedly due to their connotation as a symbol linking brides to Aphrodite. She was actually pretty well known for um, doing a lot of um, like wedding ritual poetry as well. Um, but it didn't just live in ancient Greece. Um, it seems expanded in modern times. By the 1920s, the actual color violet was common slang for homosexuality, much like you may be familiar with lavender. Um, and it, this was specifically associated with women loving women. The reference and use of flowers as a symbol of love between women was catapulted into popularity, however, in the late 20s by an adaptation of a play by Edouard Bourdais called The Captive or La Prisonnière in French. And this put lesbianism in the spotlight on the American stage in the 1920s. Uh, so it was performed on, in 1926 on Broadway, and it features a romance between two women. The lead character, Irene, is a lesbian tortured by her love for a woman named Madame de Algin, um, but she's pretending an engagement to a man named Jacques. Though she attempts to leave Madame Algin and marry Jacques, she returns to the relationship, um, the relationship with Jacques, saying that it is, quote, a prison to which I must return captive, despite myself. After returning from her honeymoon with Jacques, Irene receives a package from Madame 
and it opens into kind of corsage and violets, a symbol of her love for Irene. So this reference was well known enough at the time that it caused a scandal. New York police actually raided the theater and shut down the production for scandalous behavior. The lead actors were arrested and charged with offending public morals. And after 160 performances, the play was closed on February 27th, 1927, yielding to pressure from censorship advocates. And just to top it off, New York adopted new obscenity laws for the theater, banning plays depicting or dealing with the subject of sex degeneracy or sex perversion. Um, so there's this is a, this is a little bit of an article um, about the police raid. They, they also raided a few other plays, one of which had uh, Mae West in it as well. Um, so the captive set a precedent. It basically caused the association of violence with lesbianism that lasted decades. Uh, the queer connotations linked to the Violet were so ingrained and provocative at this point that New York actually saw a sharp decline in Violet sales. <laughs> what had previously been seen as, like an, in as an innocent flower, which was often worn by debutantes and virtuous female celebrities trying to portray their innocence, even some first ladies wore them, it lost favor in a big way. The November 1934 edition of Harper's Bazaar wrote, quote, Way back in Violet County last year, they were still cursing this play as the nail of the Violet industry. Uh, in Paris, however, the reaction to the play and its subsequent banning was vastly different than the anxiety expressed by middle-class American audiences. Go figures. Uh, lesbian groups in the audience at the performances of La Prisonnaire pinned Violets to their lapels and belts to show solidarity with the characters and subject matter of the play. So, yeah, a whole bunch of group, groups of women showing up wearing violets, very much like we saw with Oscar Wilde's entourage. Huh. Uh, this is just a short little one, but um, I, I include this one because it's a nice little, little more obscure one. Um, so, in feudal Japan, the chrysanthemum flower uh, was the emblem of the imperial family but was also, you may not know, uh, one of the most recognized and used symbols to discuss something called Renshoku, which was the male-male intercourse and relationships that was popular at the time among um, samurai and monks, uh, due to its resemblance to the anus. <laughs> There's actually uh, two phrases in uh, Japan from the time period, kiku no, kiku no chigiri, which is translated as chrysanthemum tryst, and Kiku Osobi, Chrysanthemum Play, both meant homosexual intercourse, and um, trysts, you know, sexual trysts on top of chrysanthemum patterned fabrics were commonly depicted in erotic illustrations of the Tokugawa period. Which is pretty cool. It's one that I didn't know about. So this is one, there you go. So this is one that most of you probably know. It's the pink triangle. Um, it is, probably one of the most well-known queer symbols other than uh, Gold Breaker's rainbow flag. It has uh, really traumatic origins, unfortunately. Uh, so it, the origins are in Nazi Germany during World War II and the Holocaust, used to identify homosexual male prisoners. Uh, homosexuality was made illegal originally in Germany in 1871 with the implementation of something called Paragraph 175, which was a section of the German Criminal Code which stipulated that homosexual acts between men were punishable with imprisonment and loss of civil rights. However, this was rarely enforced until the rise of the Nazi Party in the 1930s. When Adolf Hitler rose to power, the persecution of LGBTQ people was intensified, and during the course of the Nazi regime, approximately 10,000 men were arrested for homosexuality. The symbol of the upside-down pink triangle was sewn under their clothes in the concentration camps to mark them as homosexual, much like the yellow stars brand branded upon Jewish prisoners. The Nazis also used other triangles to, um, to brand other quote-unquote degenerates. Um, they used brown triangles to mark Romani. Um, they used green for criminals, blue for immigrants, purple for Jehovah's Witnesses, and the black triangle was used to mark quote, asocial prisoners, among them sex workers and lesbians and feminists. Uh, years later, there were some attempts to reclaim the pink triangle in the early gay liberation movements, starting with a West German gay liberation group called Homosexual Action West Berlin, or a Gay Action Group of West Berlin, HAW, uh, which was founded in 1971 by a group of college students. 
HAW became the first group in the world to officially adopt the Pink Triangle as a gay liberation logo in 1973, following their uh, following the 1972 publication of the first autobiography of a gay concentra concentration camp survivor. And the title of that autobiography was called The Men with the Pink Triangle. According to Peter Hedenstrom, who was a founding member of HAW, the symbol worked for the emerging movement because at its core, the pink triangle represented a piece of our German history that still needed to be dealt with. So by the end of the 1970s, the symbol had spread from West Germany to be an international symbol and synonymous with the gay liberation movement. However, many, including super, San Francisco supervisor Harvey Milk, were uncomfortable with its traumatic history. So in, 18, in uh, 1986, we actually see um, the symbol being solidified as a universal sign of queer resistance with the creation of the Silence Equals Death Collective. This was a group of six New York activists who created a poster featuring the pink triangle facing upward and the word Silence Equals Death in large block letters, which was meant to call attention to the AIDS pandemic that had already claimed more than 5,000 lives of gay men. Their idea in changing the orientation of the triangle to stand on its base instead of being upside down uh, appropriated the triangle that had been used as a traumatic and violent symbol, instead, quote, conveying the strength of an otherwise stigmatized social position. Uh, shortly after, the poster was adopted by ACT UP and became an everlasting symbol of AIDS advocacy. Mm -hmm. The pink triangle continues to feature prominently in LGBTQ imagery. Uh, for example, it was the logo for the March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights in 1987. Uh, it's also on uh, queer historical markers in New York City for the project Queer Spaces, right. Places of Trouble, <laughs> Places of Struggle, Places of Strength, uh, by the artist collective known as Repo History. And it's also um, one uh, place you might see it recently is there's an organization called Black and Pink, which aims to end the prison industrial complex and connect the public to our incarcerated LGBTQ prisoners. Uh, we also then have the Lambda. Uh, the Lambda's origin as a queer symbol begins with graphic artist Tom Dore, who was one of the founding members of the Gay Activists Alliance, which was a group that split off from the Gay Liberation Front in 1969, aiming to fo focus explicitly on gay and lesbian issues, as opposed to the GLF's more broad approach and specifically the support of the Black Panthers. In New York City, um, they designated the, this Greek letter as the group symbol in 1970. Door originally designed the Lamba as, as a gold or yellow symbol on a blue background, but it was frequently depicted in lab, on lavender. Uh, the significance of Door choosing the lowercase Greek letter Lambda as its symbol is steeped in speculation and rumor. A lot of people have different interpretations of it, but I think that the text accompanying his original drawing on a flyer by GAA says it all. So, uh, it says on this guy right here. For the sciences of chemistry and physics, the lambda symbolizes a complete exchange of energy, that moment or span of time witnessed to absolute activity. An ancient symbol brought to application centuries from its origin, lambda is the 11th lowercase letter of the Hellenistic alphabet. The Lacedaemonians or Spartans bore it on their shields, a people's will aimed at common oppressors. Likewise, members of the Gay Activist Alliance uphold it as their symbol before the nation. It signifies a commitment among men and women to achieve and defend their human rights as homosexual citizens. Activism is the operative term. Political involvement that is both assertive and effective is GAA's prime thrust. In the struggle against oppression, a cultural bond develops, suffused with human energies. The Lambda now affirms the liberation of all gay people. So the GAA adopted the symbol en masse, and they printed it on all of their apparel and press materials, and due to their sponsoring of public events to the LGBTQ community in the New York area, the Lambda quickly spread outside of their own activities and became a growing symbol for gay liberation, and also a way to discreetly identify community members. <coughs> if you were wearing a Lambda, could just be a fraternity symbol. So the symbol was officially declared an international symbol for gay liberation and rights when it was adopted for the International Gay Rights Congress in Scotland in December 1974. And the Lambda is still today in use, less frequently than in the 70s and 80s, but a lot of places you'll see it are in um, university 
LGBTQ student associations for their names and logo designs. There's uh, fraternity and sorority groups for their, that use it in their chapter names, legal organizations, other businesses. So we've got some, we've got Lambda Legal, uh, Lambda Literary, which is um, an organization that um, promotes queer literature and they uh, give out Lambda Literary Awards. And then this is uh, Delta Lambda Phi, which is a um, sorority, uh, fraternity for gay men. Which is all and uh, the UCLA uh, queer organization, Lambda Alumni Association, is one example. These ones probably now. Oh, yeah. um, so we've got here the interlocking gender symbols. Um, so these are actually astronomical symbols, and um, the individual signs have been used to represent men and women, respectively, since ancient times, referring to the Roman gods of war and love. Mars and Venus. So if you're more familiar with Greek gods, that's Ares and Aphrodite. Uh, and basically they associated stereotypical binary aspects and roles of men and women with the associated gods. The Mars symbol, this guy right here, uh, depicts the shield and spear of the Roman god of war, and the Venus symbol uh, depicts the hand mirror or distaff of Venus or Aphrodite. In the 70s, it became popular for uh, popular among gay men to use the two interlocking Mars slash male symbols to represent homosexuality, and lesbians began to adopt it as well. The concept has seen countless variations on the basic theme and formula to represent various relationships, identities, and genders throughout the years. So a couple of different examples we've got. This is one example of uh, a bisexual interlocking symbol. Uh, we also have, uh, we have a transgender symbol, which um, combines the, the female Venus symbol, the male Mars, and then a combined one for androgyny. Um, specifically, was designed in the 1990s by Holly Boswell, Wendy Parker, and Nancy R. Nancaroni. We also have um, another symbol that has been used among the trans community, which is the Mercury symbol. So in Greek mythology, um, Aphrodite had a child with Hermes, you may know him as Mercury in Roman mythology. And since the name's child was Hermaphroditus and had ambiguous genitalia, thus the origin of the now antiquated term hermaphrodite, intersex is preferred. Uh, since there's no specific symbol to represent hermaphroditus, no, astro uh, no uh, astronomical symbol, the symbol for Mercury was adopted as one way to represent the trans and intersex community. And it's also generally used as kind of a a unisex signifier in science. Um, it's also the botanical symbol for hermaphroditic plants. And then we've got a couple of others right here, just two variations on the same theme. These two right here are actually um, used to represent non-binary people. This is a more recent one. This was designed in 2012 by a Tumblr user named Jonathan R to specifically represent non-binary individuals. Um, what they did, they wanted to specifically use the X um, as a way to represent non-binary identities that don't fall into strict binary categories, and it's also something that is being used in legal um, documents and, and titles for non-binary people. Um, so you'll see you'll see it like that, or sometimes you'll see it as an asterisk, the idea of like being outside of the binary. Not all star tattoos. This is a fun one. <laughs> um, so. This it comes from the 1940s, 1950s. It traditionally is associated with sailors and pirates, and it's one of the most widely known tattoo designs in general. Uh, sailors used the North Star as a navigational aid, so many tattoo, many of them tattooed the nautical star design on themselves as a good, good luck symbol, hopes to return home safely. Um, it was also adopted by military personnel, as well as those in the punk scene. But it also has a history as a lesbian symbol. Uh, so it was popular in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, some lesbians utilized tattoos as a ma method to recognize one another. They would get uh, nautical stars tattooed on their wrists. There are um, two historians and activists, uh, Madeline D. Davis and Elizabeth Lepofsky Kennedy, who wrote in their 1993 book, Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold, The History of a Lesbian Community, um, which is their ethnography of working class lesbian communities in Buffalo, New York. They know the cultural push to be identified as lesbians, or at least different at the time, was so powerful that it generated a new form of identification among the tough bar lesbians, a star tattoo at the top of the wrist, which was usually covered by a watch. 
We can trace this phenomenon back to an evening of revelry in the late 1950s when a few butches grouped over to Dirty Dick's tattoo parlor on, Ho on Chippewa Street and had a tiny blue five-pointed star put on their wrists. Later, some of the fans of this group also had the idea to go a night and did it. The community views the tattoo as a definite mark of identification. And the Buffalo police even knew that the people who had the star on their wrists were lesbians and they had their names. So it was an identity thing. Um, and one of the reasons why it was often covered by the wrist was because it was so well known in that community in Buffalo, New York, that the police, when they were making their stings, would notice it as a queer symbol. Um, the authors also note that the star was actually one of the first symbols of, the symbols of lesbian community identity that veered from the butch femme dynamic and imagery that was very common in the 1940s and 1950s. Labors. Uh, some folks may be familiar with a uh, lesbian flag with a double-headed axe on the purple background, but before even the concept of flags as identity markers for queer people was popularized by Baker, um, the laborers was popular as a lesbian symbol in the 1970s. The laborers was the double-headed axe wielded by the Amazons, which was the mythical matriarchal warrior society of ancient Greece. So many of these come from ancient Greece. I wonder why. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, as, well, as well as being associated with the Greek goddesses Demeter and Ar Artemis, so goddess of the harvest, goddess, goddess of the hunt. Um, it was adopted in the 1970s by feminists as a symbol of radical lesbian feminist efforts meant to represent women's strength and self-sufficiency. It was printed on t-shirts and buttons, jewelry, and even appeared on the cover of books. Um, <coughs> there's one book called Gynecology, The Meta-Ethics of Radical Feminism, uh, in which the um, author imagines one being smelted from the gathered tools of patriarchal oppression. Um, and using it as a tool that must be attuned to the many impediments, impediments to women's liberation. So we've got this one image of, from our collection here. That's one of the sign. There's a little labors and like that. And then uh, yeah. this one's a little more, more uh, uh, yeah. East Coast focused, but is anybody, is anybody familiar with the lavender rhinoceros? No. <laughs> Um, so some symbols last for decades and are widespread throughout the world. Some experience a brief moment of popularity and then fade. Lavender rhinoceros is one of them. Uh, so it was designed by two artists in Boston, Massachusetts, Daniel Faxton and Bernard Bernie Toll. They debuted the image in 1974 as part of a public ad campaign for gay media action. And it was intended as a symbol of strength and resilience of the queer community. Uh, the rhino was chosen because it is a, quote, much maligned and misunderstood animal and in actuality a gentle creature. Um, the rhino's personality characteristics, right, gentle but tough when provoked or angered, seem to be a perfect uh, match for the creature. The images through ads blast around Boston's buses and subway systems, they're hoping to, in, hoping to uh, encourage the visibility of the queer community. And, but, however, Due to the rising cost of the ads and the advertising company tripling the cost of, cam cost of the campaign by refusing to categorize the ads as public service project, gay media action didn't have the funds to cover the cost and the ads were put on hold. In response, they decided to challenge the decision through organizing a protest campaign where people sent hundreds of letters to MBTA and the MTA, as well as hiring a lawyer to represent their case in court. Ultimately, they stood by their price increase and the ads were not run. But, there was a huge response. Uh, so in response, we're not going to get our ads, we're going to show this anyway. Um, the Lavender Rhino debuted at Boston's Pride March in force, uh, emblazoned on t-shirts, pins, and signs, and even a life-size finger mache rhino on a float. Uh, I really like this sign, a Lavender Rhino, so this is not imposterous. Good rhyme. Uh, and it instantly became immortalized as a symbol of queer resistance and perseverance. They eventually received donations to uh, cover the increase in ad costs, and they were able to run a small run of ads between December 1974 and, 1970, and February 1975. Um, its legacy still stands today, though, uh, in some ways, even though it was you know, limited and was usurped by things like the Lambda in popularity. Um, but we've got, uh, right here in San Francisco, we have Theater Rhinoceros, which is the longest running queer theater company in the world. <coughs> Check out some of their productions if you know it. And there we go. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of you may be familiar with this. Um, the, but 
but I wonder uh, how many people know the origin of it from uh, the mid and late 19th century among cowboys. Yeah. Uh, so among cowboys, steam railroad engineers, and miners in the West. Um, the, it's thought that the wearing of bandanas by gay men originated in San Francisco after the gold rush, when because of a shortage of, a shortage of women, men who were dancing with each other in square dances developed a code where the man wearing the blue bandana took the quote male part in the dance, and the man wearing the red bandana took the female part. Okay. They were usually worn around the arm or hanging from the belt or back pocket of one's jeans. Uh, the modern pinky code may have started in New York City in 1970-1971, when a journalist for the Village Voice joked that instead of wearing keys to signify top or bottom, men should use different colored hands. Um, Alan Selby, some of you may remember we did an exhibit on him. He's the, um, he's the creator of the Mr. S. Leather Company. Claimed that he created the first hanky code when the distributor sent a double order of bandanas, and he and his business partners decided to come up with a code to sell the extra colors. They <laughs> um, another, another notable source is Bob Dameron's address book, yes. which um, was a, a book uh, published in 19, starting in 1964 of all the gay bars he knew from his constant travels across the U.S. Uh, despite its tiny size. It was, it was an impressive accomplishment in each one of the listings he had visit, visited himself. Um, it also published a yearly chart for the meaning of each colored hanky under the title Color Codes. Uh, depending on what color was worn and which pocket the handkerchief was placed in, it signaled the wearer's sexual preferences for positions and different acts. Uh, it's, less in modern, it's less seen in modern use now, but it's still seen at like cake fairs, like Folsom Street Fair, and various festivals. Um, interestingly enough, the need for a discrete sexual advertising method, which the Hanky Code fulfilled starting in the 70s, has been filled these days in some ways with digitizing the process on gay cruising apps like Grindr. People can put all that out there without having to have a physical symbol that everybody's attached to their phones. So that is me forward. <laughs> um, so let's talk just a little bit about the creation of the rainbow flag, in, in case folks don't know. Um, so in 1978, upon urging from his friend Harvey Milk to create a new symbol to represent LGBTQ people as an alternative to the popular but traumatic pink triangle, Gilbert Baker started work on what would become the most iconic and prolific representation of the LGBTQ community around the world. He mentioned in an interview with Metro Weekly, we needed a logo, a symbol. We needed a positive image that could unite us. I sewed my own dresses, so why not a flag? <laughs> At Harvey's behest, I went about creating our rainbow flag. I had never felt so empowered, so free. And he knew the symbol had to be a flag, specifically. He was inspired by the American flag and its power because at the time, it had just been the bicentennial in 1976, and he saw the American flag being put on everything. He said, it really put the seed in my head. I was like, wait a minute, we're a global tribe and a flag really fits our mission. In another interview, he says, flags are about power, they say something. You put a rainbow flag on a windshield and you're saying something. And so that <coughs> was solidified into the future. Um, the original rainbow flag debuted to the public on June 25th, 1978, hand stitched and dyed by a team of 30 people and raised in the United States Plaza as a gesture of the flag as, as an international symbol. The original flag had eight colors, each, rep each representing something empowering to the community. So we have hot pink uh, for sex, red for life, orange for healing, yellow for sunlight, green for nature, blue for or, uh, turquoise for magic and art, uh, violet or indigo for serenity, and purple for spirit. Uh, hot pink was removed eventually due to dye expenses. Uh, uh, Gilbert Baker really wanted to be able to allow people to mass produce the flag and have it be a universal symbol that anybody could get a hold of. And the hot pink dye was very difficult to get a hold of. Um, and so they removed that, and then the turquoise was removed in order to have a flag that could be evenly split in half, resulting in the six color rainbow flag that is commonly seen today. So what happened after that? Right, we get a flag. Everybody loves it. What happens next? Flags for everyone. Since Gilbert Baker and his collaborators.
debuted the flag in 1978, all corners of the LGBTQ community have embraced the process of creating unique and beautiful flags to represent various identities. Sure. Gilbert was right. A flag is a powerful item to claim and adopt. Since 78, dozens of flags have been created and more are popping up each day. The relationship between Baker's flag and these flags has been referred to by some, including the creator of the trans flag, Monica Helms, akin to national versus state flags. Not meant to invalidate one another, but to be individual representatives of parts within a whole. The rainbow flag is all encompassing, but each of these flags represents specific LGBTQ communities and identities that each have their own history, significance, and design logic integral to the community they're connected to. So here's a few. So there's the bisexual flag, which was designed by someone named Michael Page in 1998, at a time when people were uniting under the iconic rainbow flag, but to some it seemed to only belong to gay and lesbian people. Bisexuals need the flag of their own as an effective tool to unite the movement. Wendy Curry, who uh, was a former or who is a former president of BiMed USA, said, "We wanted to let the larger world know that we were here, we're proud, and we demand respect." Michael Page actually took his inspiration from the bisexual triangles or biangles motif that was already in use. It's two intersecting pink and blue triangles converging in the middle to make lavender, which was the uh, first symbol to use the pink, purple, and blue color scheme for bisexuality. The history of the symbol is relatively mysterious. You can't really find a clear-cut origin or definitive source. Um, we know the history of the pink triangle, but the blue triangle doesn't really have a connection to the queer community. It may have been added as a foil to the pink, and the overlapping area represent the middle ground that bisexual people exist in uh, with attraction to multiple genders. So using magenta, royal blue, and lavender, Paige clarified the idea of the intersecting colors from the biangles into a powerful flag. So according to him, magenta represents those attracted to the same gender, the royal blue is for people attracted to other genders, and the central lavender is for bisexuality, and as a link to the larger queer community referencing the history of lavender as an LGBTQ color. What I thought was really interesting about this is that Page specifically addressed the issue of body invisibility with his design of the flag, saying, the key to understanding the symbolism of the body pride flag is to know that the purple pixels of color blend unnoticeably into the pink and blue, just as in the real world, where most bi people blend unnoticeably into, the, into both the gay and lesbian and straight communities. Uh, so the flag's first official, public official outing was in March 22nd. It was on March 22nd, 1999, at the Equality Begins at Home Rion Rally in Tallahassee, Florida, caught on camera and included in a front page photo of the rally. We have the trans flag. It was created in 1999 by co-founder of the Transgender American Veterans Association, Monica Helms. She's right here. Uh, she debuted the flag in a, at a Pride celebration in Phoenix, Arizona in 2000, and its colorway, which is light, light pink, or light blue, pink, and white, has been embraced widely by trans people around the world. Um, she describes the meanings of the flag's colors, saying, the stripes at the top and bottom are light blue, the traditional color for baby boys. The stripes next to them are pink, the traditional color for baby girls. The stripe in the middle is white for those who are transitioning or consider themselves having a neutral or undefined gender. She also designed the flag to be symmetrical in order to make it so that no matter which way it's flown, it's always correct, signifying us finding correctness in our lives. In 2014, she donated her original flag to the Smithsonian. Uh, so, lesbian flags. There is not currently a unified consensus around the lesbian flag that's been widely adopted. Um, there's been various designs that have popped up throughout the years. There's, as we talked about, Labris. Um, this was designed in 1999 by a graphic designer named Sean Campbell. We've got uh, the lipstick lesbian flag, or the pink lesbian flag. Uh, it consists of six shades of red and pink and a white bar in the center. Um, it includes a red kiss and was included in the weblog This Lesbian Life in 2010. Um, it, you know, it tends to represent queer women who have a more feminine gender expression. Uh, the lesbian community pride flag uh, was created in 2018, specifically to be more uh, inclusive, with a dark orange bar indicating gender non-conforming, uh, and it was created in 2018 on social media. We also have the gender queer flag. Got one right here, somewhere. Um, it was designed in 2011 by gender queer writer and advocate Marilyn Rock. 
Roxy. Um, according to Roxy, the lavender stripe is a mix of blue and pink, colors associated with traditionally men and women, and represents androgyny as well as queer identities. The white stripe, like the France pride flag, represent a gender or gender neutral identities. And the chartreuse stripe is the inverse of lavender and represents third gender identities and de identities that outside the gender binary. Mm. The non-binary flag was created in 2014 by activist Kai Rowan, intended to represent non-binary people who didn't feel that the gender queer flag represented them, and it was to be used alongside the gender queer design. Mm. Each color stripe represents different types of non-binary identities. You have yellow for people who identify outside of the binary, white for non-binary people with multiple genders, purple for those with a mixture of both male and female genders, and black for people who do not identify with having a gender at all, what we call a gender. And there's a whole bunch of other variations. Uh, there are even more flags for specific non-binary gender identities. The variations are endless. I hope you go and look online and check them out. There's a whole bunch of them. If you ever walked around going, I don't know what that flag is, Here's some examples. So there's agender, bigender, gender fluid, so a whole bunch of them. We also have the pansexual pride flag. Um, it was designed in 2010 by Tumblr user Jess Jasper, and it features a similar design to Cage's bisexual flag. Uh, it substitutes the lavender band, the lavender band with yellow, representing attraction to <coughs> people identify as androgynous, gender fluid, or non-binary. There's also a variation on the gender symbols for pansexual. And there's all, even a flag for asexuality. Um, so the asexual pride flag consists of four horizontal stripes. It was uh, gray, black, gray, white, and purple. The flag was created by a group called AVEN, which stands for Asexual, Asexual Visibility and Education Network, um, in August 2010, as part of a community effort to create and choose the flag. The black stripe represents asexuality, um, so not having sexual attraction. Gray stripe for the gray area between sex sexual and asexual. The white stripe for sexuality, and the purple stripe for community. In addition to flags, the asexual community also signals connection to each other with the symbol of wearing a black ring on the middle finger of one's right hand as a way to signify their asexuality to other aces. Uh, it's deliberately worn in a similar, similar manner as one would use a wedding ring to symbolize marriage. And it's uh, cited as being start, starting to be in use around 2005. There's also some variations within the uh, asexual and aromantic community. You can look into more. Uh, this is the logo for Aven, right here. And then we have the intersex flag. Uh, so the intersex flag was created by someone named Morgan Carpenter, who was part of the Intersex Human Rights Australia organization. It was created in July 2013 to create a flag that is, quote, not derivative, but is yet firmly grounded in meaning. The organization describes the circle as unbroken and unornamented, symbolizing wholeness and completeness in our potentialities. But we are still fighting for bodily autonomy and general in genital integrity, and this symbolizes the right to be who and how we want to be. And then we have more variations on Gilbert Baker's original rainbow flag. Some of you may be familiar with seeing a flag, a rainbow flag that has added the black and brown stripes to the top, or uh, this one here with black and brown stripes and the trans flag colors as a chevron. Um, so in 2017, the Philadelphia's Office of LGBT Affairs proposed adding a black and brown stripe, uh, a black stripe and a brown stripe to the rainbow flag specifically tasked with addressing the amount of racial violence that was happening in the community, uh, specifically in gay bars. As one of uh, the supporters of the flag noted, quote, with all of the black and brown activism that's worked to address racism in the neighborhood along, over the last year, I think the new flag is a great step for the city to show the world what they're working toward fully support, show the world that they're working toward fully supporting all members of our community. And then someone uh, named Daniel Quasar, who is a graphic designer, went a step further in Zero Zoning, um, Zero Zero Zoning uh, pronouns, and in 2008 um, added the black and brown stripes along with the colors in Monica Helm's trans flag as a chevron and the hoist of the flag to signify the work that still needs to be done in the community in ensuring inclusivity, safety, and advocacy for queer people of color and for trans people. Many of you may also be aware of the AIDS Awareness Ribbon 
uh, moving away from the flying spit, I wanted to highlight a very important symbol. Um, so it was created by Visual Aids at the Artist Caucus, inspired by the custom of tying a yellow ribbon around a tree to welcome home military or convicts. Um, the group developed the red ribbon to be a symbol of the AIDS epidemic. They chose red standing specifically for blood, passion, anger, and love, and it debuted at the 1991 Tony Awards and it exploded in popularity. They couldn't keep up with production and they would actually pull ribbon bees where attendees assembled ribbons by the thousands to distribute. Uh, the Ribbon Project made clear the political and community spirit of the symbol, stating their requirements regarding the decision to never copyright it. They wanted it to remain anonymous as individuals and credit the Visual, Artists Aid, the Visual Aids Artist Caucus as a whole in the creation of the project, and to not let any individual as the creator of the Red Ribbon. Keep the image copyright free so that no individual or organization would profit from it, and use the Ribbon as a consciousness ra raising symbol, not as a commercial or trademark tool. So it remains one of the most recognizable symbols of the AIDS pandemic and has expanded beyond LGBTQ communities and the United States. And then lastly, uh, the popularity of the flag as a signifier for the LGBTQ community has gone beyond representing sexual and gender identities and it expanded into representing different subcultural groups within the queer community, kinks and fetishes, and non-traditional relationship models. And they've actually been seen outside of the LGBTQ community. LGBTQ community. Some examples, uh, the Leather Pride flag was created in 1989 by Tony DeBlaze, who was a founding member of the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago. Uh, it, it was unveiled at the International Mr. Leather Competition. He left the design up for interpretation, but it's clearly invoking the dress of the leather and BDSM community of black leather and blue denim. Uh, we have the Bear Brotherhood flag, created by Craig Burns in 1995. Uh, there's the Rubber Pride flag in 1994, Polyamory Pride, 1995, and Pony Play, 2007. So, let's expand. Where do we go from here? There's so many. There are so many flags being proposed and designed every day by the current generation of queer people. There are even Reddit groups that you can go visit, like Queer Vexillology, encouraging people to come up with their own unique flag designs. They're doing it every single day, and more and more and more are popping up. So what will we see in the future? And with that, we're bringing in Lena, who's going to talk about what y'all are going to make, which is the future of these flags. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, can we go for like way around the clock? So, as I mentioned, uh, some of these symbols are everlasting. We still see them all the time, and some of them kind of came and went. And a big reason why some keeps around today and will keep going in the future is because of good design. So, I'm going to talk to you about good design, specifically good flag design. So good design is important because uh, if you have a bad design and people don't like it, they probably are not going to remember it or uh, want to wear it, things like that. So I'm going to talk about some principles of good flag design and then introduce our hands-on workshop. So here's a couple of basic rules to good um, vexillography, which is designing flags. So the first thing is to keep it simple. We want some simple symbolism that people are going to remember, that a kid could draw if they wanted to copy it, um, that people can use on many different things. Uh, the second is meaningful symbolism. The colors, the shapes, um, the emblems that you put on a flag, you want them to have meaning and you want them to have significance for the group that you're trying to represent. And then the third one, which uh, a little up to, to, for debate when it comes to pride flags is limited colors. Um, most flag design guides say two to three colors, but um, the rainbow pride flag is a great example of that rule being very much broken and it being very successful. So uh, think about that with color palettes of what colors are going to look good together, what colors are going to still be distinct from each other um, and not be too chaotic. And then the last rule um, is either is an either or, either be distinctive or be related. So as we were talking about earlier, Gilbert took inspiration from the American flag, and so uh, he used those stripes in a similar way. 
So you don't want to do a flag that um, is exactly like someone else's flag. You don't want to copy it. But also you can take inspiration from other flags that exist and maybe improve on them or change them. So as, as an example here, I put two um, flags up. The first one is very well designed. We talked about the intersex flag just a second ago. Very simple in design. Um, it's very distinctive. It doesn't look like any other pride flags. And the colors and the shapes are significant. And you don't have too much going on. Great design. Um, some not so great flag design, which we could debate about, is the uh, straight ally flag, which we could talk about if they need a flag. But uh, that's not the reason why it's a bad design. Um, it's pretty chaotic, I think, is the main reason. It is not nice to look at um, on the eyes. Uh, but it does have some elements of good design. It references the um, rainbow pride flag. Um, the triangle shape looks like an A for allies. So it has some elements of good design, some elements of bad design. Good taste is subjective. <laughs> yeah? So uh, that's some basics about what makes a good flag and an effective flag. And so now we're going to move into the hands-on workshop um, part of today's event. I'm going to introduce that and then you'll get your materials. So uh, basically you have a chance to design any sort of flag or symbol you want. So it can be for just you and your identities, it can be for a group you're part of, it can be for a group you're not part of. Maybe there's a flag that we talked about today and you hate that flag and you want to make a new flag, you can feel free to. So go wild. Uh, we're going to pass out some craft materials, but anyone who's not at a table might want to come over to a table, I mean, or work on the floor if you really want to. Uh, and yeah. We're going to go crazy. If you have any questions, like while we're doing this workshop thing, you can definitely ask Lee about like history stuff, the informed one, and you can ask me about design stuff. I know that. So don't ask me about the history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does anyone have any questions about design before we start?